Welcome. I'm so excited to be able to be with you here today. My name is Corey Lewis, and I have the privilege of serving on the National Board of Leading Influence. Though I would love to be able to meet with you in person, I'm so thankful for this format. For now. Soon. Soon we will be able to meet together again. Knowing that our God is not limited to time or space, I know he will hear our heart's prayer, no matter what the format. I must say, I can't imagine the stress load that you, our political leaders, have been under these last couple years. And then, within days, the world has pivoted yet again. The work you do is vital, and I'm confident the decisions you make weigh heavy on your souls. I know firsthand that you care deeply about the people you serve. I have had the privilege of working alongside of some of you in your past careers, and I have seen you desperate for good, healthy outcomes for the people you serve. That's what excites me about leading influence in the opportunity for Fred Hill here in Saskatchewan and Tim Schindel on a national level to come alongside you and encourage you as you serve the people of this amazing province. At this time, I would like to introduce you to Todd Gowdy, MLA for Melfort, who will be sharing with you about the benefits of leading influence. Hi there, my name is Todd Gowdy and I'm the MLA from the Melfort constituency here in Saskatchewan. I've been here for four years now, and during that time, while session was on, we've had a prayer meeting pretty much every Wednesday morning. Um, Greg Ottenbright is the MLA here that has facilitated that over the years, and he's a bit of a character. Told us one day that there was going to be a man who was gonna come and, and work as a chaplain for any MLA who, who would uh, desire to have that service. So I, I got to admit, I thought there's no way that somebody could uh, really be able to engage both sides of, of the, the house here, uh, government and opposition, and service in a way that, 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 that would really be effective. And then, and then I met Fred Hill. Uh, Fred is a delight to all who know him. Uh, he has truly strengthened, I believe, uh, likely both caucuses. I can't speak for the... The NDP, but uh, I know on our side of the house, uh, he has made a real impact in our lives and been a strong support for us, and not just us, but also the the meeting that they've just started with the CAs. I've heard great things. A lot, of, a lot of the the baggage that is is uh, unloaded onto the CAs on a weekly basis. Basis, they they need supports, and Fred has has begun to do that role. We love the guy. We just want to say thank you to all those who support him. And we look forward to the years that are ahead in working with such a genuine lover of men. So God bless you, Fred. Thank you for your service. And thank you for all those who support him. Take care. Thanks so much for that insight and the introduction, Todd. I can't begin to express how humbled I have been this past year as I began to find my way, not just my way around the legislative building, but my way in how to serve and how to support the MLAs, their staff, and the other officers of our amazing legislative system in Saskatchewan. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the great team that we have at PraySK.com. For any of you that don't know, one of the important activities of our ministry that we undertake is to write and post a prayer for a different MLA each weekday. There's this great team of people that make this happen, and it's their prayers for our MLAs and for me that are instrumental in creating access for me, both physically, spiritually, and especially relationally with the officials and staff. Thank you, Team Pray SK. Now, as I prepare to pay, pray for the legislative MLAs, I also want to commend them for their service and especially for the welcome that I've received over this past year. Man, I've had the privilege to meet face to face with almost every MLA in our province. It's their willingness to, to meet and to begin building relationships that will pay off in the future because we all need close personal relationships where we can be transparent about the real emotions and the real issues that we're facing. And in many cases, I'm glad to be that source of support. Please join me 
as we pray for our provincial elected officials. Father, we acknowledge first that you are sovereign over all things. You have declared and claimed as your own all forms of government. Father, we thank you for this as your wisdom and your thoughts far exceed our own. With that in mind, we ask that you would establish your purposes in the hearts of each MLA, regardless of their faith and regardless of their personal agendas, that your agenda becomes their agenda, that your will becomes their desire. Father, we also ask that you would provide a renewed sense of joy and service for these men and women as they fulfill their duties and obligations. Please remind them of the successes that they have already enjoyed and the good that they have already achieved. As they face trials and difficulties, would you bring to mind the advances that they have already made? Father, in a democratic government like ours, there's lots of ideologies and hopes that are present, both in the formal government and in those that form the official opposition. We thank you for the structure that you've established that permits an exchange of ideas with room for challenge and room for improvement. Would you give each MLA in Saskatchewan a renewed capacity to hear and to understand what needs to be protected, what needs to be improved, and how to knit together the complex solutions that are needed in these days? Father, as I close this prayer, I ask for blessings upon the families of the MLAs, that they would be both protected and blessed for the sacrifice that they're making in releasing their partners and their parents to serve this great province. Amen. Thank you so much for praying with me for our elected officials. Hello friends, I'm Tim Schindel, National Director for Leading Influence and our Spiritual Care Provider for Ottawa. Thank you for joining us for our 15th annual and our second virtual prayer breakfast. If this is your first time with us, give us a thumbs up in the comments. We'd love to acknowledge you today. Before introducing our speaker, I have some very exciting Leading Influence a point to point news to share with you. In the past year, we've added two spiritual care providers to our team, one in Manitoba and one in Newfoundland, making us a bi-coastal, or as our Victoria-based BC chaplain likes to say, a rock-to-rock -rock ministry. We're now serving in seven provinces and in Ottawa. These are exciting times for our team and for our many, many ministry partners. Thank you for your support in making this happen. Our speaker today is Abe Brown. He is the founder and CEO of Certified Flourishing Coach. He has trained thousands of coaches who are helping people around the world to flourish in every area of their lives through a science-based approach to coaching. I was so impressed with Abe's insight and material that I became a certified life and leadership coach last year as a way to strengthen my ability to serve and support people in my circles of influence. I'm confident today that Abe's well-informed, thoughtful, and high-energy message of resilience, mental wellness, and practical strategies for supporting your mental health in today's context will encourage you and give you hope for a better day. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy my friend, Abe Brown. Welcome, everybody. My title today is a bit of a mouthful, but I think it will be a ton of help to each and every one of you. I want to talk today about four simple strategies for supporting your own mental health as a leader and the mental health of your team. And of course, I want to take a moment to thank Tim and the team at Leading Influence for your invitation. I'm really grateful. And I want to thank all of you for your service, for showing up, for leading, and for be willing to listen today. Now, as we begin to slowly emerge from the global pandemic, most practitioners in the field of mental health agree that along with the pandemic of COVID-19, which is primarily physical, there's also a pandemic around mental health. It's possible that this pandemic of mental health might prove to be even more devastating than COVID-19 in the end. This mental health pandemic has created enormous challenges at a personal, professional, relational, and even societal level. But 
It's also created incredible opportunity for resilience and for flourishing. I know this because I've looked at the overwhelming data that point in that direction and because I've been on the front lines of this from the very start. Now, my introduction to the mental health pandemic happened around March 15th, 2020. I happen to live in Alberta, and like most of the country, the Alberta government instituted a total shutdown to flatten the curve. Our team at Flourishing Workplace focuses on workplace mental health, and I had been asked to give a talk to an association of local entrepreneurs in a community called Okotoks. It was virtual, but as I began speaking on leader mental health and supporting team mental health, and then when I opened it up for discussion, I was shocked that in this professional meeting with over two dozen attendees online, there was a vulnerability and brokenness like I had never seen around stress, anxiety, fear, and worry. People wept openly as they shared what they were experiencing. From the start, I could see how real this pandemic of mental health was. Now, a short time after that, I was asked to give a talk to an association of HR professionals of the thousands of keynotes that I've given in my career. This was by far my toughest yet. One of the co-chairs of the association had recently lost his life due to suicide. And my role was to speak to the group about grieving and leader mental health. This was the speaking opportunity you never want to get, especially when I learned that due to the challenges of the lockdown, which had devastated his business and his cash flow. He had to lay off his entire team. He could not maintain his personal or business financial obligations. His despair led to the ending of his life due to suicide. And you know, tragically, he left behind his wife and his children. Now, that is tragic. But on the other hand, despite the pandemic and the enormous challenges faced by leaders, there were also shining examples of unbelievable resilience and flourishing. I think about one of my clients at Flourishing Workplace, a, 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 an organization led by two immigrant brothers where they incorporated the simple strategies that we teach for supporting their own mental health and that of their team and how they actually grew in staff numbers and in physical locations and in revenue in a bricks and mortar business. They run restaurants and food service in the middle of the pandemic. Their commitment to implementing the simple strategies that we teach for supporting their own mental health and that of their team was amazing. Investing in their own mental health and that of their team was a cost to them in the middle of the pandemic. And yet they saw this investment and they made it and they saw incredible returns. Now, even before COVID-19, leaders, entrepreneurs and executives were especially at risk when it came to mental health. You know, in June of 2019, so just before the pandemic, the Canadian Mental Health Association, supported by the Business Development Bank of Canada, re released an in-depth report examining Canadian entrepreneur mental health. The study revealed the following, that 62% of business owners feel depressed at least once a week. 46% say that mental health issues interfere with their ability to work. 67% were stressed about their business's cash flow. 51% reported feeling inadequate and 50% reported depression. 66% of entrepreneurs face difficulty in maintaining a work-life balance due to stress. And of course, all of these feelings were felt by female entrepreneurs and leaders, but at an even higher rate with greater frequency. Now, I'll tell you what, that tells me that we're experiencing a crisis. We were experiencing a crisis of mental health among leaders and entrepreneurs even before COVID-19 happened. And in March 2019, the World Economic Forum also talked about a mental health crisis raging among leaders and executives. They discovered that leaders are twice as likely as the general public to suffer from depression, six times more likely to suffer from ADHD, three times more likely, three times more likely to suffer from substance abuse and 10 times more likely to suffer from bipolar disorder. Not only that, but they were twice as likely to have a psychiatric hospitalization and twice as likely to have suicidal thoughts. Now, all of these statistics were referring to owners, uh, businesses, entrepreneurs, but also leaders and executives, people in prominent leadership roles. And all of these stats were pre COVID 2019. You don't need to be a psychiatrist to imagine that those numbers are likely worse as a result of the pandemic. And in my view, addressing this ongoing mental health catastrophe 
for leaders, it's a moral imperative. Mental health is as essential for knowledge work in the 21st century as physical health was important to the, for, for physical labor in the Industrial Revolution. I'll tell you what, now the tools of our craft are creativity, ingenuity, insight, innovation, and critical thinking. I mean, these are the cognitive cornerstones that create value and that allow you as a leader to operate at your best. And yet depression, anxiety, and mood disorders are all working to undermine leader performance. They contribute to burnout. They contribute to conflict. They contribute to toxic cultures. They contribute to high turnover. They contribute to an inability to hire top talent, contribute to an inability to show up for meetings and poor decision-making in general. Here in our province of Alberta, you know, we saw a, a situation in, in, in the middle of the pandemic where one of the ministers of government, uh, you know, essentially came forward and, and talked about how alcohol had completely taken over his life. And so when you are in a position of responsibility, when you are in a position of authority, when you're in a position of leadership, not only do you wrestle with the same challenges that everyone else uh, wrestles with, but you also have that added weight and that added burden. And I think that's a part of why we see worse mental health outcomes among leaders than the average public. You know, the reality is that leaders are trained to ignore their own needs for well-being. The ethos they've internalized is this idea of no pain, no gain. And it's a sad message that they have experienced that success is purely measured in quantitative returns, you know, ROI, profit, all of those things. You know, there's 10 reasons I think leaders are at risk when it comes to mental health. I'm just going to give them to you as a list because they don't take a lot of explanation. But these 10 reasons leaders are at risk when it comes to mental health, I'll tell you what, I'm sure that they speak to some of you here right now. Number one, higher expectations. Number two, longer work hours. Number three, larger workload. Number four, consistent image management. Number five, a blending of personal and role identity. Number six, greater stress. Number seven, deeper uncertainty. Number eight, increased social isolation. Number nine, larger risks overall. And I think number 10, either less access to health benefit plans or just less time to use them. See, the challenge for leaders is how do I manage my own mental health? And yet, how do I support the mental health of my team? So that's my question. How do we do that? Well, I think you can do it with four simple strategies that I'm going to share with you right now. Mental health and flourishing is not a trait that people are born with, like some kind of genetic bonus. I'll tell you what, it's like a muscle. It's more something that we can develop in our own lives. Each and every one of us can create positive mental health and flourishing when we learn these four simple strategies. I'm going to go ahead and give them to you right now. Strategy number one is self-care. Now, self-care is this idea of loving yourself. And I know we hear a lot about self-care and we think about, you know, we hear the term self-care and we think bubble baths and candles and a glass of wine. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But I'll tell you what, it's far better to invest in yourself through the vehicle of self-care. You know, when Warren Buffett, the investment king, was asked, what's the best investment you ever made? He said, the very best investment you can make is an investment in your Self. Now, in ancient tradition, whether you're a person of faith or not, it's amazing this story to me because in ancient tradition, there's this idea that the creator worked for six days and then rested on the seventh. So even the creator, the one who made everything that we can see, everything that we can taste, touch, smell, see, and hear, that same creator worked six days and rested on the seventh. Now, Ovid was a Roman poet who lived during the reign of Caesar Augustus, and he said this, Take rest. A field that has rested gives a bountiful crop. For millennia, farmers have known that every so often they need to let their field rest. Okay, why is that? Because land that rests purposely, left unseeded for one or more growing seasons, allows the soil to regenerate and the minerals and the elements needed to regenerate to grow productive crops. Now, metaphorically speaking, your field and mine, it's our body, it's our mind, it's our spirit. It's no secret that how well they work depends on how well rested they are. We need appropriate timeouts if we want to live a vibrant and a productive life. I wonder, are you thinking about rest and self-care? Now, I know for many of you, 
It's almost impossible to think about sleep, nutrition, and exercise because your schedules are so crazy and often, I would imagine, so out of control. And so I want to have empathy here today, and I don't want to give you a list of things to do, but as much as you can, wherever you can, in, in as much as you possibly can make this happen, adding more sleep, adding more nutrition, adding more exercise to your daily routine, these things will have a massive impact on your mental health and your leader effectiveness. You can also try practices like meditation, affirmations, visualization, journaling. And you know, hey, you might not have time for those things. Then maybe you can try something like this, gratitude. And that's something that you can do constantly in the moment, just the practice of gratitude. How about forgiveness? <laughs> that one's tough. Just allowing yourself to let things go. What about taking some time to go and be in nature? I'll tell you what, these are some incredible ways that you can care for yourself. And hey, as a leader in your sphere, as a leader in, of influence, it's really important that you care for yourself so you have something to give. The second strategy, strategy number two, is called self-regulation. Now, self-regulation or emotional regulation is really just the ability to regulate or adjust your emotions. We're not talking about strict emotional control. I'll tell you what, if you're a leader, often you're a leader because you're a passionate person. You're a person with emotion. You're a person with pathos or feeling. And so obviously, we're not trying to strictly control every emotion. But what we do want to do is channel them in a healthy way. When we channel our emotions, we can still express ourselves and vent our feelings, but not in a way that's unhealthy. Emotional regulation is so important because feelings drive behavior. So when we learn to regulate our emotions, they can serve and support us rather than the other way around. Now, when you think about emotional regulation, here's a couple of strategies that I have found have helped me. I think the first thing I've done is I've started to see my emotion as dashboard indicators. And I'm sure we all drive cars and you know, we can see the dashboard indicators that give us information about what's happening on the, under the surface in the engine in the different sort of, you know, tubes that are running through your vehicle. You know, I'm definitely not a technical person. And so as, as, a, as an emotion comes to the surface of your life, you want to notice it. You want to notice how you're feeling. You want to notice what people and events are contributing to either positive or negative emotions. And you want to take that as something of an indication. But secondly, using the metaphor of a vehicle, you want to keep your hands on that steering wheel. Your emotion is just the dashboard indicator, but you are ultimately the person who's in control. And I'll tell you what, right along with that, don't run out of coolant. Learn how to self-soothe. Learn how to let go of the things that you are hanging on to emotionally that you might need to let go of. As a leader myself, I found that so many times I'm hanging on to emotions that I need to just release and let go. And so the first uh, sort of strategy for your own mental health is self-care, but the second is self-regulation. Strategy number three is safe relationships. Now, mental health and safe relationships, you know what? They go hand in hand. Human beings, they're social animals. They're hardwired to connect with others. Research across all kinds of disciplines consistently demonstrates that social support will enhance your productivity. It will enhance your psychological well-being and even your physical health. In fact, George Vallant, Harvard professor of psychiatry who directed the world's longest continuous study of physical and mental health, when he was asked what he had learned from his 40 years of research, he said this, the only thing that really matters in life are your relationships to other people. I'll tell you what, hardwired into the deepest part of our in instinct to survive is this primal realization that without deep connection, without belonging, we cannot survive or thrive. People who have social relationships that are satisfying, people who feel loved and cared for by others, they're more physically healthy and they live longer than people who feel socially isolated. And when you have that social connection, it will protect you against heart disease, against cancer. It will contribute to your immune system. It's not a cure-all, nothing is but it will have a massive impact on not only your physical health, but also your mental health. And I'll tell you what, for you in your roles, so many of you, I'll tell you loneliness is such a part of the picture. And that's tragic because who is safe? Who can you trust? Who can you open up to? 
I'll tell you what, it's so critical that we find safe places. It's so critical that we have social connections as much as we possibly can. Let me go ahead and give you strategy number four. Strategy number four for building your own mental health and the mental health of your team is supportive connections. Okay, supportive connections. Now, I want to talk for a moment about spirituality because I believe that spirituality and mental health go hand in hand. Now, often when we think about spirituality, we think of religion or some sort of faith community. And of course, that is true. But there's, spirituality is this broad concept with all kinds of perspectives. Spirituality includes a sense of connection to something bigger than us. To some degree, spirituality is that search for meaning in life. Spirituality is universal and it touches every single one of us. And here's the thing. Mental health and spirituality are connected because healthy spirituality lifts us beyond the idea that this life and the present stuff that we're all facing, that that is the complete picture. When all you see is what's in front of you, how many of you know that's tough, right? Resilience is hard because the pain of the present moment can be overwhelming. The stress that you're feeling, the situation that you're facing, it can literally take over. But what a spiritual mindset does is it helps to elevate your perspective so that you develop the capacity to endure setbacks and the struggles of this present moment because you see them as temporary obstacles. Now, part of this idea of supportive connections is also connecting with others who know how to help you with spiritual questions, spiritual concerns. There are legitimate spiritual guides out there who can support you in your journey. I'll tell you what, people like the incredible team at Leading Influence, along with other spiritual care providers. Those are a great example. I'll tell you what, in my own spiritual journey, I've had the pleasure of connecting with teams like at you know, Leading Influence and other places, and they have been critical to sometimes help me put it all into perspective. Why is that? Well, because in the end, we all live and get by with a little help from our friends. And so as I conclude, I want to thank you for listening. Please hear me out. You're a leader and Canada needs you. Your province needs you. Your community needs you. Your family needs you and your team needs you. And I'll tell you what, all of us, we need you at your best, mentally healthy and flourishing. And you can, as you apply these four simple strategies for supporting your own mental health as a leader and the mental health of your team. Strategy number one is self-care. Number two, self-regulation. Number three, safe relationships. And number four, supportive connections. Thank you so much for listening today. Hi, I'm Sandy Jo Ayers, and I'm honored to represent the Board of Directors for Leading Influence this morning. This year's breakfast has been a little different experience than what we're used to, but we hope you enjoyed our time together. Thank you to our speaker, our member friends who provided testimonials, and to you for being with us today. We are so glad you could join us. Leading Influence is funded entirely through the generosity of our ministry partners and friends. We neither seek nor receive government funding. Before we conclude today, we want to give you an opportunity to support our work financially. If you're watching this as the live premiere, you received an email from us in the past few minutes inviting you to support our work financially. And if you're tuning in later, please click on the donate link in the comments below. Your gift is entirely tax deductible and you can direct the contribution to support one of our team members our Lead Well course, or give it to the general fund to help where most needed. If you'd like to become a monthly partner, you can indicate that through the donation process with Canada Helps. Your generous support is always appreciated. We can't do this vital work of serving Canada's elected leaders without you. Thank you for joining us today, and God bless you.